Can we just bow our head? I'd like to just have a short prayer before we start. Our Father in heaven, we ask for your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we ask because you have promised. You have promised uh, the presence of the Spirit through your Son. And we're asking in his name that you may guide us, open our minds, our understanding, and the application if we need to apply what is being heard. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to open this morning with um, <clears throat> three Bible texts, and then I'll move into the sermon. The first one is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. So it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. And it's, it's sort of a continuation of last week's sermon for those who were here. If you weren't here, it's okay, um, because it is still a different sermon, but it's continuing the same theme. And I've been told this is Three Angels' Messages. It may be a little bit different than what you're normally hearing in Three Angels' Messages, but uh, by God's grace, I hope you can understand where, I'm, where, where, where the meaning and where it's coming from. But 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says this, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Yes, every single one of us is part of this magnificent body, and Christ is the head. Another text is found in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Ephesians 4, 7 and 8 says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. What was given to us? Grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, talking about Christ, he led a captive of the host of captives and he gave gifts unto men. This verse here is telling us, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he released something very, very special and very important to us. And what did he release to the church? He released gifts onto the church. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11 says this, But one and the same Spirit works all these things. It says one and the same Spirit works all these things. That's 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11 distributing to each one individually as he wills. So, but one and the soul, so it's the same spirit distributing different gifts according to whom he wills. The verse tells us the Holy Spirit is the one who chooses how he delivers those gifts. God has placed and entrusts us within this church gifts that are extremely valuable in his sight. We have been given gifts and they have been carefully measured out through divine allocation. God has distributed these gifts to every person in this church. Every one of you, and we, we, it was shared last week, has been given a gift. Some have more than one gift, some just have one gift, but some have multiple gifts. But it's the Holy Spirit that distributes these gifts. God has done this in a very, very personal way. However, the Bible is very clear and it states that we will all give an account. We're all going to give an account of how we have handled that which has been given to us. The Bible is very clear in this area. For Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, speaks about the gifts as follows. And he talks about he as and he himself, that's Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's for the equipping of the saints, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. How are we using these gifts that have been entrusted unto us? Are we edifying one another and using them in the building up of our beloved church? These gifts are to be used in God's service to minister to one another and to reach out to people who have perhaps never heard or contemplated the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there is another message that is loud and clear about the gifts. There's another message that is loud and clear about the gifts that are given to the church. And that is that every one of us has been given, us, has been given these gifts to help us to prepare, prepare us for the second coming of the Lord. And we heard uh, about that last week. The gifts have been given to us to prepare us personally for the second coming of the Lord. So if we're using those gifts, 
will be actually growing spiritually and being prepared to meet our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. While we're using these gifts, we are not only benefiting those around us, but these very gifts, when put into practice, are in turn training us and refining us, disciplining us and teaching us to be in a constant submission and dependence of our God. Thus preparing us for His glorious appearing, we will not fulfil our mission unless we are using collectively We will not fulfill our mission unless we're using collectively what God has given us individually. Does that make sense to you? We must be using collectively what God has given to us individually. This all leads to one thing, and that's worship. Using your gifts to the glory of God is an act of worship. This is a great call that is to go out to the ends of the earth. When worship becomes collective, the gospel will fly swiftly through the earth to every tongue, tribe and people. No one can do this alone. Nobody can do this alone. God has not designed the body to function that way. God has not uh, designed the body to work independently. Every member must work together. It takes a principle And this principle needs to be understood. I don't think it's properly understood. If it's a principle that becomes universal. And I believe that God is in the process of unveiling that reality to us. And as the end draws near, those who are not using their gifts for the Lord will eventually find no part, unfortunately, in the body of Christ. Although Jesus sought everything he could, everything to keep Judas Iscariot connected. It was Judas who eventually separated himself from the disciples and Jesus and betrayed his Lord. See, Jesus never threw Judas out. Judas felt uncomfortable. It is not that God arbitrarily decides to throw us out or people out but some will not feel a part of the body. They will feel uncomfortable to be in a place that reveals their true character and it reveals their lack of engagement and lack of connection to the body. It is God's desire that all of us claim the gifts that God has given us and use them for His glory, for His kingdom, to edify one another and to minister to all. With this in mind, we are all part of something very, very great. Do you agree with that? Do you agree? We are all involved in the Great Commission that is echoed through the three angels' message found in the book of Revelation, chapter 14. We are all part of that. Revelation 14, verse 6. I want to just hone in on this. Revelation 14, verse 6. The voice of the first angel flying through the midst of heaven. It says, and I saw another angel. That's Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw, excuse me, another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The Bible records that this angel is flying in the midst of heaven. What does it mean that he's flying in the midst of heaven? Fly in the midst of heaven, it's in the air. The angel appears to be moving upon the face of the sky with a bird's eye view of the earth. The scene cannot be in heaven as the gospel is not to be preached there. But where is the gospel to be preached? In the world. So the scene is in the world. So this angel is is flying in the midst of heaven with a bird's eye view. The earth is in the vision of this angel. The earth is, is in the vision of this angel. Flight represents speed in the scriptures. And this is an urgent message. It's a symbolic, it's symbolic not only of speed, but also of urgency. It is flying between heaven and earth through the air. This is the fastest way to travel to get from one side of the world to another, and you know that. The church is designed by God to work as one, 
Although there are many parts of the body all around Sydney, all around the state, all around the country, all around the world, no single person can really be effective operating independently. Do you, believe, do you agree with that? No one can be effective in this work if you're operating independently. God has strategically placed and is placing his people in every tribe, suburb, district and city in the world. Do you know how many countries that the gospel is in? Do you? Do you know how many countries that the Adventist church is in? You know the Adventist church is in more countries in the world than any other denomination, even the Catholic church? Did you know that? Amen, Amen to that. Thank you, Renato. The believers must be connected where they are, being part of their home church. And I'm a strong believer of this. That you need to be connected in your church that you have been connected to, attending regularly and serving in fellowship. If all, I want you to picture this. Just picture this for a minute. If all the local churches are using their gift, functioning in the body, which they are connected to, edifying one another, reaching out first to their family, friends, neighbours, community, city, and then they will be joining with the angel who is flying in the midst of heaven. You see, it's a collective effort using your individual gifts to do that. They are partaking in the message of the angel, as I said, flying in midair. We are all to operate from where we are. It's a, ble- it's a best place to operate from. This is not to say that we can't have mission trips. I'm not saying that at all. To assist others. But we need to understand first that mission is at our very door. We need to be able to ha- make it happen here before we can train others to do the work and to replicate it. Do you agree with that or not? Do you agree? I, I, I've, been, I've been praying and praying about this and I'm convinced and convicted that it needs to happen where you are before you can really effectively take it anywhere else. There must be a home church for everybody. Just like you go home to your homes, doesn't that feel good that you have a home to go to for those who have that privilege? And I say home, I mean your family. The saddest thing when people haven't got a family to go to. There's a lot of people living on the streets today, you know that, don't you? We are not meant to be freelancers in this body working independently, but we are to be working close together. I am so convicted on this, I cannot tell you how much I've prayed about this through the years. I've asked Lord, have I got the wrong... Con- I've asked him, am I wrong about this, Lord? But I'm more convicted, especially as I study the Scriptures and I look at the early church, what was happening, that that's the way it needs to, to be. Into working together interdependent, interconnected, complementing one another. The message needs to be preached. So when we are observed, when people are watching, we, we're watching us, we are functioning in harmony, in unison, giving glory to God as we move in the direction in which we're called to go. Verse 7 of, that, of uh, um, chapter 14 says this, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The context of the loud voice is a reference to the penetrating power and the force of the message. That's a reference of the loud voice. This voice is superior to any other voice that's, that's in the world today. There are many voices in the world, but this voice of this angel's message is superior to any other voice on this planet. This call has conviction behind it that is far-reaching. It is able to penetrate into the very depth of the soul of those who are hearing it. It is the Word of God, the everlasting gospel, that is shared with a power 
of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says this. It talks about the Word of God. It says the Word of God is living and powerful. What is it? Living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We are traveling with a message, with the Word of God that can actually do this to every person on the planet if they open their ear and their heart to it. The three angels depicted in Revelation 14, 6 through 11 are symbolic of those who are bearing the earth's last message of salvation. It is a body of Christ working as one body in every place where two or three or more are gathered. Do you understand what I'm trying to share with you? That it has to happen in every place locally to actually be powerful and effective. It is a philosophy that I believe is biblical. The message the body of Christ carries is a call back to worship. True worship where the Creator is the centre of our lives in all that we do. You see, we can preach something, but if it's not visible in those who are preaching it, it is very difficult for the people to embrace it. Do you you agree with that? So whether you eat, it says, or drink, or whatever you do, you do it all for who? For the glory of God. That's what the scripture says. Whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. This is the three angels' messages. It is a message that is not only spoken, but it's actually lived. Worship the creator that made heaven and earth and the sea. Are the ones that use effectively... They use their gift effectively to convert people and bring them in harmony with God. This is true worship. We ourselves need to be worshipping God in the way the Scriptures exemplify worship. We cannot share the message effectively unless we ourselves are experiencing worship. We need to leave our idols. And what are they? We need to leave our idols and join in a transparent relationship with our God you see, you cannot have a, uh, a transparent relationship with God when you have hidden idols in your life. They must be put down. Kim Lam. Yeah. So what does worship look like? What is this worship that is calling people out with a loud voice? Now I want to share with you We're not left to guess or go to the world or to go to places of entertainment to try to entertain people to find out what it looks like. God has not left us alone. The Bible tells us that after Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the early church and this church accomplished extraordinary work. The Bible tells us and shows us what worship looks like. We have to look at the most successful church that the earth has ever seen, and that was the early church. In Acts 17, verse 6, is an account of the believers in the city of Thessalonica. Some believers were dragged out of their homes and and presented to the authorities because of the influence in that city. Because of the influence in that city. It says that these who have turned the world upside down have come here also. What did the people say in Thessalonica? They said these people who have turned the world upside down have come here also. What a testimony of what the early church was accomplished. What they were accomplishing, sorry. The early church is here documented for us what they were doing so we can see what worship actually should be like. We are not left to guess. Before the church can move forward, it had to understand the simple reality that they were all one body. And the scriptures very, very clearly point this out to us. You see, all through Jesus' ministries, the the disciples were not really united. They were bickering, there was jealousies, self-righteousness, 
One wanted to be at the right hand of, 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 of Jesus when he ascends into the kingdom. There was all this going on. There was a time when they went out to, um, to cast out demons and they came back and they couldn't cast some out. And Jesus said, this one, these demons can only be passed pa- um, pass through prayer and fasting. Meaning that they weren't united. They needed to come together before they can do God's work. Jesus did something. That was the beginning of their journey of being deeply connecting to the body of Christ. What did Jesus do? It is found in John 13. If you go to John 13 verse 4, you'll see that. While they were all disunited, Jesus did something to give them an example of what they should do. And verse 4 says this, John 13 says, So he got up from the, from the meal. This was the Lord's... Well, this was um, the last supper that he had with them. Took off his outer gut clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And verse 12, go down to verse 12, he says to them, Do you understand what I've done for you. Do you understand what I've done for you? What do you think he had done for them? He served them when none of them wanted to serve each other. You see, it was too much for them to humble themselves and to wash even their Lord's feet. It was considered to be only for those who have the lowly estate to do that. And what did Jesus say? Do you understand what I've done for you? Then he says in verse 15, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Shortly after, Jesus was crucified. In Acts chapter 2, the resurrection has taken place. You see a change with the disciples. There is a true unification taking place. A knitting knitting together believers in the body of Christ and worship has emerged as a sweet savour unto God. Let's open some scriptures here and just have a, a, a little look of what the early church looked like and what we should look like. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So the first thing that you see before any great thing was accomplished was they were all in one accord in one place. One place, one accord. I don't think we truly understand how important this actually is or we'll see more and more of it. This must take place first as a precursor in order to be involved in the message that is to carry it out to the whole world. You see, the message is global, but it happens locally. The message is global, my friends, but it happens locally. How can anyone go out and teach others when they haven't really experienced them for themselves? How can they draw people into a, 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 a church when they themselves don't really attend that church? It is very, very difficult to do. This is a concept that many of us haven't yet come to terms with or understand the power of what the, 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 the disciples were actually doing. If all the local churches around the world were functioning as a body, Where they are, the gospel will very quickly surround the earth because God has ordained it this way. This is the way in which God has ordained it. This is God's model. It is not anyone else's model. It's God's model. And the devil is constantly trying to separate the people of God because he knows if he can do that, he will stop or hinder the message that needs to go out to the world. You know, the Bible says um, that... Jesus will shorten the days. 
for us, no one will be saved. We need to get this, my friends, if we want to be part of it, or we'll be falling away. So what brought them together in one place and how are they in one accord is the question we need to ask. What brought them together and how are they in one accord? The answer to both questions is they were obedient to Christ's command and they waited in Jerusalem as they were instructed for the promise of the Father. They learnt obedience and they waited for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But as you read Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White says that they did not wait in idleness. They were confessing their sins to one another and praising God in the process. They came to terms with themselves and they started confessing to one another their sins. This is a, not an easy thing to do. But they saw their great need to do it. And they were praising God in the process. They knew that they had a representative heaven, an advocate at the throne of God. They understood the reality of a risen saviour. Jesus Christ, who was risen from the dead, was making intercession for them in heavenly places. He is, he was their high priest, he is our high priest even today. They are now a close-knit praying church. Then the Bible records that the Holy Spirit came into the room like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. They were filled with the Spirit. This is another identification mark of what worship looked like in the early church. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were given gifts to meet the pressing needs which surrounded them and equipped them to share the everlasting gospel with a loud voice. Gifts of faith, healing, teaching, wisdom, tongues, and the list goes on and on. There were many gifts bestowed on the church, and these gifts were united together and moved and reshaped who they were, and the world and the everlasting gospel was preached. They preached boldly without fear, favour, or compromise. It is incidents where they were persecuted, dragged out, um, stoned, All these things were happening to them, but they had courage, my friends. They had a passion for evangelism. They recognised the urgent need of bringing the message of salvation with them wherever they went, and they had the joy of witnessing conversions and people going through the waters of baptism. Acts 2.41 tells us that those who accepted this message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number in one day. They were a community that cared and loved one another, another identifying mark of what it looked like. They saw themselves as brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles. Giving themselves was a distinguishing feature of the life of the early church. You know, we don't know how good that feels unless we do it. Is it true? It says there, Acts 2, 44, 45, all the believers were together and everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone who had need. They were a generous, generous church. There was an extraordinary sense of caring for one another. It was who they were. This too is an act of worship. Most people understand the vertical nature of worship and this is a modern concept that we just do devotions to ourselves, we just pray in our secret homes, and we've done our duty. However, worship is not only vertical, but it's horizontal. It should move out into the life. Corporate worship is important because it fortifies the church. Our worship needs to be expressed in a responsive way that reaches out in giving, sharing, and caring for one another. This is exactly what the early church was doing. When we allow our gratitude that we've experienced with God flow out into others in service, our spirit is quickened and our faith is reinforced. It's how you grow. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 49 and 10, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. 
I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. The psalmist made it clear that he is not to conceal God's love that he's experienced. How would he conceal that love? By being silent, my friends. That's how you conceal it. He felt this urge to share what God has been doing for him and in turn it came out in service. The church was also another identifying mark of the church or an act of worship. It was highly organised and it was spiritually trustworthy with the men that were leading the church. Acts 14.23, they appointed elders in each church. Titus 1.5, Titus 1, 6 and 9 shows you there was structure and order in the church. It was a safe church too, another identifying mark. It was a safe church. They looked after the widows, they looked after the orphans. They believed in church discipline and understood the importance of it. That kept the church safe as well. There were, there were a lot, if you look at the early church, there's so many things. I'm not going to go through them all, obviously today I can't. I'm just touching on some. But the early church also valued corporate Bible study. Most Christians today own several Bibles. However, Christians today exhibit an unprecedented biblical illiteracy. It's amazing. More people own Bibles than ever before, but more people are biblically illiterate than ever before. According to one statistic, 60% of confessing born-again Christians can't name five of the Ten Commandments. 81% don't believe or aren't aware of the basic tenets of Christian faith. 12% think that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Now, it's it's laughable, but these are some more. I could have put a ton of things here that you'd probably be laughing, then you'd probably be guilty of some of them. Another way the early church expressed their worship was they spent a lot of time together. Outside the Sabbath hours, they were in their homes eating together. What a beautiful thing. I grew up in, in a family that, that I experienced this when I was growing up. My, our family was huge. And we'll be in each other's houses all the time. It's, it's one of the greatest experiences you can have. And to this day, I longed to have that at the church. And, I, and we weren't even <laughs> churchgoers. But we understood uh, that and we experienced that. And it's such a beautiful feeling if, if we can all do that and start understanding the, 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 the value of that. They spent a lot of time together. I, I was... Um, a little example I saw of this was of worship was when I was in Fiji just before uh, sunrise in the morning. I was awakened by local Fijians on the island. The melodious voices were praising God in song. Their voices wafted through that whole island. It was such a beautiful, beautiful experience. They would do this before they started work. They would do this when they finished work. What a beautiful experience it was. And they would do this every single day. And I joined them, but my problem is I couldn't understand Fijian, but I still felt the presence of the Spirit. It was such a beautiful experience, and I'm thinking this is what the church felt like. True worship. It sounds a loud voice, my friends, to the world, to fear God and give glory to Him. It calls, it calls people to worship him that made heaven and earth and everything in it. Read the scriptures, my brothers and sisters, and we'll see more, much more than what I've shared with you. If we're truly to preach the everlasting gospel, we must have a look of who we are. I truly believe time is at hand. God is beginning to shape his church. He needs it to be a church that is reflecting the image of of Jesus. I believe that God is in the process of doing this, my friends. I really do believe that God is in the process of shaping his church and it's a painful process. I'm just going to activate. Can we activate this, please? I want to share with you a story to end with of Michelangelo. When he was sculpting the image of David from a block of white marble, people would watch him. They watched the master chiseling away. At first, it looked like a piece of marble, 
that was being brutally hacked with a hammer and chisel. People wondered if it would ever take form. As they were watching it, they were questioning whether he could actually shape it. It was a time-consuming task. A time-consuming task. But while he chiseled away the marble, sharp pieces were falling to the ground and they'll be swept up and taken away. But slowly the image of David was appearing. Slowly and precisely, he kept chiseling away until the image of David appeared with clarity and precise symmetry. You could even see the veins in the sculpture, in the, in the, in the arms. People were astonished and admired the sculpture. They couldn't help to gaze upon it and were attracted to it. And they had to ask him the question they were all eager to ask. They waited and they were contemplating, they asked. How did you do this amazing work with a block of marble, they asked. Michelangelo replied, All I had to do was chip away anything that didn't look like the lad. All I had to do was chip away anything that didn't look like the lad. And so, my friends, God is doing the same work with his church. And I believe he's in the very process right now, at this time in earth's history, to chip away what doesn't look like him. My friends, anything that doesn't look like Christ, he's chipping away at. And I know as he chips away at us and we see the parts in our life that doesn't look like Christ, we come to him and ask him for mercy. And as we all do this individually and we humble ourselves before our great God and he convicts us individually of those things, we are being shaped into the image of Christ individually and corporately. Then the message will go out with a loud voice, with power and glory, to call people home, a building that God is the architect of, that you have, and I have the privilege of calling people to Jesus Christ, but we can't do that only by words. We must allow the moulding and the reshaping of our lives so, so we are in conformity to God's will. And the church will eventually reflect the image of the mighty one who has called us out of darkness into marvelous light. Do you want to be part of that? Do you want to be part of that? I want to be part of that. I want to get to heaven. Do you want to get to heaven? There's only one way to heaven, my friends, and we are to surrender to our Lord and Savior. Let him do the work he needs to do in your life. Let him strip away those idols. Let him remove every crutch that you're leaning on. Well, the only one left is Jesus Christ that you're going to lean on. He's going to do this to, for you because he has to. And believe me, my friends, he's been doing it to me. And as he's been doing it to me, I understand that he's preparing me for a great, great time. Maybe bow our heads. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you don't leave us in darkness, but you introduce to us a shining light that surpasses any light we've ever seen. We want to thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ is that light, that he is the one that descended upon this earth touched humanity in the flesh, walked amongst us and was suspended between heaven and earth on the cross that we may be saved from our sinful nature and be, be transformed by his renewing grace. I thank you for the plan of salvation. There's no other plan that can be, ever be devised to save the human race. I pray for us as a people that we may understand how our high calling, which is in Christ Jesus, 
To God be the glory. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.